Good day and welcome. Today, we will motivate using basic thermodynamic concepts, an explanation for why salt is used to melt ice and snow. This is a very important process in colder regions of the world. First, let us begin with a few rudimentary definitions. In this presentation, we define temperature as how much heat something is able to give off. And by heat, we mean the spontaneous flow of energy on a microscopic scale. Hence, warmer bodies are able to give off more heat whilst colder bodies give off less heat. This is why heat spontaneously flows from higher to lower temperatures. A coexistence point is the transition between two phases of matter. Think melting or boiling point. It occurs at a particular temperature that varies with pressure. For instance, looking at this diagram, we see that water melts slash freezes at zero degrees Celsius at one atmosphere. At a coexistence point, both phases of the substance are present as both phases are equally stable. Enthalpy is the energy needed to create and establish a system out of nothing. For this presentation, we are concerned with the solution enthalpy, the energy needed to dissolve an ionic lattice into solution, the lattice enthalpy, the energy required to convert an ionic lattice into gaseous ions, and the hydration enthalpy, the energy required to dissolve gaseous ions into solution. Next, entropy is a measure of the system's disorder. It is related to the number of possible configurations the system's components can have, as well as the amount of energy a system has that is unavailable to do useful work. All you need to know for now is that liquids and gases have more entropy than solids of the same substance. Contrasting entropy, Gibbs free energy describes the amount of energy in a system or a system's components that is available to do useful work. This quantity changes depending on temperature, pressure, and the number of particles. At a phase boundary, the change in free energy between the two phases is zero, making both processes, for example, melting and freezing, equally likely. We say that they are equally spontaneous. Spontaneity describes a process which, once started, requires no additional input of energy. All spontaneous processes increase the entropy of the universe, and at fixed temperatures and pressures, they also decrease the free energy of the system. Finally, chemical potential is defined as the free energy per particle of a system and describes the ability of a system's particles to move across the boundary, in this case, across a phase boundary. This quantity is defined as the minus the rate of change of entropy with respect to the number of particles at constant volume and internal energy times temperature. As temperature describes the direction of heat flow, chemical potentials describe the direction of the movement of particle for two systems in contact from high to low chemical potential. At diffusive equilibrium, the net flow of particles is zero since the chemical potentials of the two systems are equal. Moreover, at a phase boundary, the two species are at diffusive equilibrium. Now, let us get into the crux of this presentation, the mechanism that causes salt to melt ice. This is known as freezing point depression. What is it, you may ask? Well, freezing point depression is the lowering of the freezing point of a pure substance due to the addition of non-volatile solutes or impurities. It is given by this equation. However, let us save that for the chemists and instead direct our focus to this three-step thermodynamical mechanism that encapsulates and explains. Step one, when placed in contact with salt, ice melts. Recall from before that at 273 degrees Kelvin, the phase boundary at one atmosphere, both phases are present and they're at diffusive equilibrium. Hence, mu of ice is equal to mu of water. When salt is added to the sample, it dissolves in the liquid phase and changes the chemical potential of the water by a term related to the molar fraction of water in the solution. The chemical potential of a solution is always lower than that of a pure solvent. In other words, mu of ice is now greater than mu of salt solution, and the two phases are no longer at diffusive equilibrium. Therefore, the net flow of particles is now non-zero across the phase boundary. Ergo, more ice is melting than brine is freezing. In terms of free energy and entropy, the brine is more thermodynamically stable, thus producing it is therefore a spontaneous process. Now, why does adding solute lower the chemical potential of the solvent? Well, because once the solute is dissolved, the molar fraction of liquid H2O decreases from one in pure substance to a value less than one, which is why that term gas constant times temperature times the natural logarithm of molar fraction of water is negative, leading to the result mu of water is greater than mu of salt solution. Statistically speaking, this means that there are now fewer water molecules in a given volume that can transition across the phase boundary to form ice. 
Thus, the rate of liquid water to ice diffusion goes down. <clears throat> this can also be used to explain why the melting point has been lowered, because currently, mu of ice is greater than mu of solution, and thus we must be to the right of a phase boundary. Step two, solutions have lower freezing points than pure substances. This really begs the question of how can diffusive equilibrium be reestablished when solutes or impurities are added? Recall the following. Number one, Gibbs free energy and consequently chemical potential is temperature and pressure dependent. Number two, chemical potential is minus the partial derivative of entropy with respect to the number of particles at a constant volume and internal energy times temperature. Number three, the entropies of liquids and solutions are generally greater than the entropy of a solid of the same substance. And finally, number four, the chemical potential of a pure substance differs from that of a solution by the term gas constant times temperature in Kelvin times natural log of the molar fraction of the solvent in solution. Bearing these in mind, observe a plot of chemical potentials of water, ice, and salt solution at various temperatures and at one atmosphere of pressure. The liquid and brine curves are steeper than the solid curves due to point three, and each curve has a negative slope due to point two. Observe the coexistent point between pure water and ice is that T naught is equal to 273 degrees Kelvin, where the ice and water curves intersect. However, the salt solution curve is shifted to the left with respect to the pure water curve due to point four. Hence, the coexistent points of ice and brine is that T is less than T naught. In other words, the freezing point of the solution is lower than the freezing point of the pure substance. Step three, when salt is added to ice or snow, the temperature of the resulting mixture drops. Let us break this down into a step-by-step -step enthalpic process. Number one, the lattice of salt is converted into free ions. This is known as lattice enthalpy. And number two, the free ions dissolve into water to form brine. This is known as hydration enthalpy. If we consider sodium chloride, for example, with a lattice enthalpy of 787 kilojoules per mole and a hydration enthalpy of minus 769 kilojoules per mole, the enthalpy of solution turns out to be positive 18 kilojoules per mole. As with most salts, this process is endothermic, meaning that energy input is required to dissolve the salt into water. This requisite energy is taken from the internal energy of the water and has an overall effect of reducing the temperature of the end product. We can picture this from our definition of temperature, the ability of a body to throw off heat. 18 kilojoules per mole flows out of the water as heat in order to permit the salt to dissolve. Hence, the system now has less thermal energy and has less of an ability to throw off heat, meaning it has lowered this temperature in this dissolution process. In fact, we did an investigation by mixing one teaspoon of everyday kitchen solutes with tap water to see if the temperatures of the final mixture did decrease. And lo and behold, the experiment confirmed the theoretical results. Speaking of other solutes, you may wonder, do we observe a similar phenomenon with say sugar or cornstarch? Well, for that, another investigation was done. Nikolai and Cameron, take it away. Okay. Uh, hello, this is uh, the uh, experiment for Physics 203 for our project uh, with me, Nikolai, Cameron, and Chuck. So for our project, we are seeing how four different uh, household items and uh, uh, additives and soluble additives into uh, water can affect the thermal uh, properties of water. So for this experiment, we have uh, got equal amounts of water frozen in the uh, uh, freezer. Going to take them out, put about a teaspoon of each of the uh, different uh, solvents on top of the uh, frozen water and see which of the waters free, uh, um, melts the fastest. So here we'll take out our cups of water and then put on the salt and we'll do this with all of the different ones. In our experiment, we found that salt was the most effective solute for decreasing the melting time of water. We found that instant coffee had virtually no effect, sugar had a small effect, and cornstarch in fact increased the melting time for the water. This increase in the melting time of water upon the addition of cornstarch goes against the theory that adding any solute to a solution will reduce the freezing point of the solution. Thank you for chilling with us. Next time you find yourself in an awkward conversation, you're now armed with the knowledge to break the ice. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a like and give us some feedback. Also, 
be sure to check out our experimental evaluation in the link down below. Until next time.